The Dog and Deuce Show is produced by Daimar Productions in association with Studio B Productions. Welcome to Utah's longest running sports podcast. This is Dog and Deuce. It's a great week to be a sports fan. The Utah BYU rivalry game will go down on Saturday. The NFL kicks off and BYU is headed to the Big 12. We will break it all down. Plus, we'll discuss Donovan Mitchell's positive impact on the community. Proud to be the official podcast of Bishop Sycamore. This is Dog and Deuce number 381. Join the conversation at dogandeuce.com or send an email to dogandeuce at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to episode 381 of the Dog and Deuce Show. If you want to know more, and I sure hope you do, follow along with the show notes at dogandeuce.com. Watch this show all weekend long on your television sets on K Patter TV. Or if you're in southern Utah, watch on Backcountry TV. And as always, you can listen wherever you get your favorite podcasts. We would love to hear from you. Send us an email to doginduce at gmail.com. I'm Dog. But I'm Deuce. And this is episode 381 of Dog and Deuce. We want to uh, give a big thank you to Tucker Bass, who does the King Speak podcast. He had us on uh, over the weekend. It was over the long weekend on Labor Day. And we previewed the, the, the rivalry game. We talked a lot of national uh, football. And it was a lot of fun talking with him. So check that out. We'll put links, as always, in the show notes at dogandeuce.com. But thank you to Tucker for having us on. That was a lot of fun. Tucker, doing what he does. Keep doing good work. It was fun. Uh, what a way to start my Labor Day morning and rivalry week. It was nice because it kind of gave me uh, things to think about when we're going into this preview for the for the rivalry week. So it was a lot of fun. Um, I hope you wrote those down. I did. I wrote down. We, we made predictions on the show. I know. So I good, wrote good. down wrote as I, down, as I always I do. Been, I always been trying write, to remember mine since I'll Monday tell you, night. You had 3514. 3514 Utah. That's who you had. All right. Good. I, good. I, I like went, that number. I went 3121 Utah. That's right. So less faith. We will, uh, when we get down to the nitty gritty, I'll give you an opportunity to change that if you want to. Okay. As, as we've discussed things and go on. Uh, as always, we're on YouTube, so head over to youtube.com slash DD on sports. Click that like button, uh, subscribe, click that bell, do all that kind of stuff, and also comment. And uh, you will get extra content. We do extra stuff there that we put up. Um, so just check it out, man. We really appreciate everyone who's done that so far. Uh, okay, we got a big show, a huge show, like so much to talk about. It's ridiculous. This is our busy season. But there's one thing, and I know people hate when we don't get right to the sports, especially the Holiday Chamber of Commerce. They, they can't stand it when we do this. But I have to ask you one thing because it's been eating me up all week. So my daughter, 10 years old, she has, there are words that I'm not allowed to say because she, she cringes. So one of them is cringe. I'm not allowed to say cringe. Mm. Me and Jess are not allowed to say cringe. We're not allowed to say sus. Do you know what that is? Like suspect? Yeah, like sus. Not allowed to say that. And not allowed to say oddly satisfying. <sighs> So, of course, I mean, I'm a, I'm a dad. I have to just torture her with it. Yeah. But it's getting, it's getting to the point now where she's really starting to get pissed. She's, she's pushing back hardcore. Yeah. I mean, I'm with you. Do you have stuff Mine like that? Mine was like, anytime my daughter said something about a boy, I'm like, oh, smoochy, smoochy. <laughs> that is so good. I see. That's great. Okay. And they hate that. So that one's been eliminated. It, it actually caused like a, a border on panic attack for my children because I said it so much. Yeah. yeah so you got to push the envelope, but she's pushing back. She is, man. That's the problem. She's my daughter. So she knows how to give it as, as good as <laughs> as good as I do. It's frustrating. So uh, I just had to I just had to ask because she's like, you better not talk about it on your show. I'm like, nope, Dude, it's on there, Ali. I'm going to talk about it on the show. So we'll see if she listens. And it's been cringe worthy. A little sus and oddly satisfying all in one you know, one fellow swoop. Torturing her and watching her cringe is oddly satisfying, I got to <laughs> say. It's a lot of fun. Okay, let's get into the sports talk, the sports ball. Um, I think we got to start. Look, Utah State had a big win. I know. 
any other week, we're leading with that because they had the biggest win of the week. Sorry, Aggie fans, but it is the Holy War. This is rivalry week. These teams have been playing for 125 years. I went back. This is their 102nd matchup together. And I am counting the Brigham Young Academy days. So, which should be counted. Which should be counted, absolutely. If not, I think it's their 95th matchup. So, um, so we got to talk. I mean, we just we have to, man. And I, look, I get it. I, I understand a lot of you fans are like, we don't need BYU anymore. We don't want to play BYU anymore. It doesn't help us anymore. I understand all of those arguments. I'm a Ute fan. I like, I get it. Here's the thing though, man. Like to me, rivalry games, rivalries, you don't get it like you do in college sports. There are rivalries in professional sports, but it's just not near. I mean, the one that I can think of that might be, uh, that is probably just as passionate is Red Sox Yankees. Other than that, I, I'm hard pressed to think of a, a professional rivalry that matches what we get in college. And nowadays, with college football in particular, but college sports in general changing so much, first you had the transfer portal. And then, uh, you know, conferences are changing rapidly every year, it feels like. And now NIL. Like, we're kind of losing what is making, what made college sports so magical to someone like me. Uh, I, I'm not saying these these changes are bad. I'm just saying we're kind of losing that. So we have to be able to keep rivalries. Like we have to, that, that to me, it, it makes it so much fun. I love this week. I love it. I love the trash talk. There, like there have been times when I've seen it on Twitter and I'm like, it kind of irked me a little bit. And then I had to stop. Like I saw some BYU fans talking trash and then I had to stop and be like, you know what? This is fun. That's what, that's what this week's for. So I know that, I mean, you and I have been Ute fans our whole lives. These young people who, who've got the nine in a row, who have, uh, they were, you know, just wee little babies when the last time BYU beat Utah. They don't know the torture that we went through for so many years. So it's fun. Like, this is what makes it fun. What is your thought? I know, I know you're a big proponent of keeping the rivalry going, but what is your thoughts in general on the game? I mean, yeah, right. It's rivalry week. And and you're right. Like from a bigger schematic standpoint, at least as college football is currently set up, <clears throat> there's not a lot that the Utes have to gain from playing them from just a pure season impact, right? It can only hurt them if they lose, whether especially if they have a really good run in the Pac-12. So I get all that, but that's not what really matters, Right. We never started a season, at least when I attended the University of Utah, not often, worrying about making a college football playoff. <laughs> you know, like you never, that's kind of a deeper into the season thought process as opposed to starting it with that. So it feels like you fans who are about 30 and older want to play the rivalry and 30 and younger don't. And this is a clear generational difference built on by you obviously haven't experienced years of frustrating football and had <laughs> one or two seasons. Like you just assume the youths are going to trot out there and win eight or nine games every year, beat BYU, even being down 20 in the third quarter. Like it's easy peasy. This is not the history of Utah football. If you followed it since you were born and are above the age of 30, Do you appreciate the rivalry for what it is. I mean, it should be fun. It can get tedious and people can ruin it. Right. But I mean, if you think about it, like Tom Hackett, who's been on our show, who we love, like one of his greatest quotes, and this guy won the Ray Guy Award back to back years and is one of the hundred greatest Pac 12 players ever. He was voted to that squad. One of his greatest quotes is this is Utah's world and BYU's living in it. So, you know, and he had some bangers when he was accepting his Ray Guy yeah. Award, too. But still, that Good quotes aren't in short supply when Tom Hackett's around. Exactly. But I mean, that's the one that goes comes to mind, at least for me. And he's a top 100 player and a two time Ray Guy Award winner. It matters to the players. It matters to the coaches. Maybe the young fan base wants to see it go by the wayside. I personally don't. And I think. Honestly, it's sort of 
disingenuous. Honestly, I can actually be agree with BYU fans on this one. All the Utah fans who say they don't want the rivalry seem to be the ones most affected by rivalry banter, which yes. I find a yes, unique exactly. and oddly absurd uh, stance or position to have. It, the more you shout about how much you don't care, the more it's obvious you really care a lot. Exactly. And it, it's, it's, I, I totally hear what you're saying. Look, I get it, man. I get it. Like, that's why I had to, I mean, I'm, I'm in my forties now. So I had to come to a point where you say to yourself, look, man, like, yeah, they're my right. I don't like, I, I don't like it when we play them because I get so frustrated and it affects me more than other games, but that's what makes it fun. I had to get to the point where I just said, this is supposed to, this is what it is. Like you're supposed to be enjoying this. If you're getting so stressed out by it and so upset and so angry by it, you you should probably just take a, a step back and look at it in a bigger perspective because what makes it so frustrating is also what makes it so sweet when you win. Now here's my problem. Uh, a lot of the younger Ute fans and I'm not like, look, I know I sound like old man, get off my lawn right now, like you back in my day type stuff. But younger Ute fans, I, I feel like they're looking at nine in a row and they're just like, oh, we got this. We got this. Here's my problem. I'm so, I, I was so disappointed so many years that I, every time the game is close, which it almost always is, I'm thinking back to Johnny Harleen. I'm thinking back to Austin Colley. I'm thinking back to Max Hall. Like, I'm thinking back to those times when it was, uh, the, the magic happens, Lavelle's final game, you know, like those things, that's what goes through my mind. It's not the, oh, we pulled it off in 2019 or 54 to 10. I don't, that doesn't even, I've been so negatively affected by losses in this rivalry that I have a hard time just accepting that Utah's going to win. You're right. And, and, and for those Utah fans that we're talking about, if you don't recognize and immediately know those four events in the rivalry that were just discussed, Heartline, Staley, 4th and 16, Lavelle's last game, then you don't know. Then you, you need to know, actually right. get more involved in the rivalry. You would understand the pain that is currently being discussed. Right. And I want to be clear. Having said that, like, it should be fun, blah, 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 blah. Dude, come game time on Saturday, yeah. I'm going to be twisted up like a knot tight as can be and nervous as all get out, especially if the Utes go down early, more like, stressful. I, I want to be clear. I don't think it's in the bag. I think the U is more talented. I think the U is, uh, you know, the program has risen above BYU's program year in and year out. There may be exceptions to that rule, but uh, it is a rivalry and sort of the fear of a loss is what makes it special. Exactly. Right? It yes. makes every fan feel like Nick Saban. Because what do all these great coaches talk about? Like, yeah, I don't really enjoy winning. I hate losing. It's not, you don't even really enjoy the win in a rivalry game as much as you just want to see them lose. Because Yeah, you're right. Because by the end of the rivalry game, when the Utes win, I feel more relief than anything. Right. I'm not, I'm not as, like, I'm happy. Don't get me wrong. But I'm not elated like I am when we beat USC or an Arizona state or, you know, like I'm just, it's like, okay, it's gone. Now I can, I can deal with it for another year. You know, I can't, but here's the thing. This, this year is even bigger because this is the first time they played in two years and they won't play again for another two years. And that's, that's maybe, in fact, our our good friend, like one of our oldest friends on the show, Matt Quinney, he actually mentioned this on on Twitter. He responded to a tweet I I had out and he said, enjoy the rivalry because it may be the last one for a while. Inclusion into the Big 12 may make it difficult to add more games for a while as I expect BYU will have to include current schedules to be uh, made up before adding new new non-conference games. BYU really needs to get a win because he's a BYU fan. And he's right because we don't know. Like I understand we're scheduled in two years and last year's missed game has been rescheduled. But... With BYU going to the Big 12, we don't know what's going to happen. We really don't. So this could be the last one for a while. So this is a big one, man. This is huge. And I, I, I'll go ahead. I mean, recognize right now, this is shaping up, if you're a BYU fan, to be like a weekend unlike any other. You join a current P5 conference on Friday, it sounds like. Congratulations. Um and then if you pull off the upset and beat the 21 ranked Utes on Saturday, does it get any better? I mean, does it? 
Like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, I think that, and I wish you wouldn't have just reminded me of that because that's like the most BYU storybook thing to ever happen. Damn it, man. Like now, now I'm actually nervous about this thing. I was nervous before, but now I'm even more nervous. Um, I mean, as we mentioned, we're, we're, we're Utah fans. So we obviously are looking at this through a, a, a Utah lens, but you know, we try and keep it as objective as possible. Um, Here's what I don't like about having to break down this game every year, especially when it's early in the year. Because for even if it's the last game of the year, you really don't, you still don't know what's going to happen. This is the game is weird every single year. It every single one has its own identity. Every single matchup. It's it's bizarre how strange this game is. It doesn't matter how much more talented BYU is some years or how talented, how much more talented Utah is other years. It's always close. Like people like to talk about the 54 to 10. That's not, that's an anomaly, dude. That's an anomaly. In fact, I'm going to read you just the last nine that Utah has won. I'm going to, I'm just going to read you the, the margin of victory. So the last one, 19 was eight, 18 points. So that's good. Eight points, three points, one point, seven points, uh, seven points, three points, 54 to 10. And one point. So it's not like, like as Ute fans, we love to pump out our chest. We love to say we've been dominating them nine straight. But I mean, a couple bounces the other way. It's not nine straight. This game is always, and I would say almost definitively in all of those years, you would look at the, at the uh, matchup and say, Utah's probably more talented just because it's the Pac-12 effect and all that stuff. And also as Ute fans, we have to be prepared BYU is going to the Big 12. I'm not saying they're going to even it out, but it's going to be the talent gap is going to be closer as they get to the Big 12 and transition. It might take a couple years like it did for Utah in the Pac-12, but I mean, that's part of going to a big conference. You get that boost in talent, in recruiting, in money, and all that kind of stuff. They can invest more into the program. So it could be that we're more evenly matched, more back to the Mountain West days. Who knows? I could be wrong. Uh, I'm sure Ute fans are pretty pissed right now, but I, I, that's what I see happening. It's interesting. I will be interesting to see, like, a, you know, and, and even kind of Kyle Whittingham had to deal with this when he entered the Pac-12. Kalani Sataki at his core, I mean, I know he played on the offensive side of the ball, but his coaching history pretty much resides on the defensive side of the ball. And while I agree with you, the talent gap probably will close as BYU enters the Pac-12 supposedly tomorrow. Um, the question is, how does that play out? I mean, do we see BYU being like in the future, 54 to 48, you know, cause that's kind of how the pac 12 or the big 12 plays football, which isn't really how BYU is doing it currently this year. Maybe last year that could be the case could be made, but it'll be interesting to see if they can put up the offensive numbers once all this shakes out, but it's rivalry week. And I'm, I mean, it, you know, rivalry is getting me through life at this point is how I'd like to describe it. I mean, I'm not as amped as I could be. And as we will get closer to the game, I will be. But man, there are a lot of questions and there's a lot of interesting, you know, um, concepts, I guess, to sort of discuss, you know, was BYU's eight point margin of victory versus Arizona a sign that they're not what we thought they were or is Arizona better? Utah, while they played exceptional and, and did what they had to do versus Weber State, there was a lot to be, you know, left to on the table, whether it was fumbles, a kick return. I mean, look, a lot of times in, in rivalry weeks and rivalry games, ask Auburn, Alabama, ask Brandon Burton and, and, and Mitch Payne. Special teams really have an impact in these games. And it's probably not too stoked to Kyle Whittingham. Now, granted, I recognize that the returner for Weber State is the best that's ever done it in the lower divisions of college football, but still, it's a concern. Yeah, I mean, uh, on the one hand, I'm I'm thinking that kick return last week against Weber State uh, was embarrassing, and that leads me to be a little concerned. But on the other hand, I'm thinking maybe that was the best thing to happen because then Wits now now Wit is going to be chewing their ass out. And so I would be surprised if you see something like that happen again, because Kyle Whittingham, look, he coached special teams. He was the, the special teams coach for many, many years. 
That's that's his bread and butter. That's what he does. We know him as a defensively minded coach, which is very true. But he also is he's very big on special teams. That's why Utah always had great kickers and, and great punters, um, because he's very, very big on that kind of stuff. So I, I don't expect that to happen again. But you, you know what? You're right. Here's the thing that this game is already hard enough to break down and to preview when we do know these teams very well. But right now, I don't think we know who BYU is, and I don't think we know who Utah is. It is yeah. so early, and the, the the sample size is so small, and there's so many question marks with the opponents they played that we don't know what we got. And I don't know if we'll know it after this game either, because, you, because this game is so weird, and weird things happen in this game, I always feel like every single performance we see is almost an anomaly. It's It's crazy. So, I mean, the more I've thought about this, so my prediction, you you had Utah winning 31-14. I had Utah winning 31-21. No, you had 35-14, excuse me. That's right, 35-14, get it right, 21-point victory. So three touchdowns. Uh, I had a, a 10-point victory, 31-21, um, with Utah kind of pulling away towards the end. I, I just don't... I. I, the more I think about it, the more I, I dude, this is going to be another, like how often has there been a 10 point victory in this thing, you know, in the last 10 years? And the answer is twice, like 10 points or more. That's it. So to me, I'd like, I'm, I'm, I'm almost rethinking my score. I think I'm going to stick with it since it's already on tape, but I don't know. Are you going to, you really are still confident after our discussion? I, absolutely. I'm confident. I mean, look, special teams are my concern. Let's not forget Jaden Redding missed an extra point. That, that's how one point victories occur. True. Missing an extra point. True. That's typically how those occur. Um, so special teams are an issue. But look, Devin Lloyd played awesome in, in versus Weber State. And I know Weber State isn't BYU, but Weber State is a good first test, right? I mean, while the Utes will be outweigh them and be talented, more talented than them, you know Weber State's going to fight. And they're really good for what they are, right? I mean, extremely good. Top level. FCS squad, uh, FBS, whichever it is, division two, whatever it's called nowadays. I always forget. I should get that down at some point, but the defense looked solid. They didn't give up a touchdown till late in, in the Weaver state game. Right. And if you evaluate how that plays against Jaron hall and BYU's offense, I think the youth's defense looks pretty formidable. I don't anticipate Algier having quite as easy of a time running against the Utah defense as he did versus Arizona. I think that's a reasonable assumption. If you're a BYU fan and you disagree, tell me what reason you would have to believe that. Right. Second, and it's a big thing. Jaron Hall started, what, three or four games now? Never a rivalry game. Granted, it's at home, so that's helpful. But there is pressure on BYU. Everyone thinks, I mean, it's sort of, to me, it's sort of the inverse. Everyone thinks the pressure's on Utah. I'm not really sure if that's the case, if you actually think about it. Like, sure, we want to get 10. Witt wants to get the record. We want to, con- you know, you fans want to continue having that, be able to hold that over BYU's head. But BYU, as the rivalry might not come back, as Matt Quinney talked about, and heads to the Big 12, they got to get a win. They, they have to. They have to. You know, I mean, so recognize there is nothing in their playbook. If I were Kalani Sataki and A-Rod and special teams coordinator, I don't know if that's Lamb or who it is down there anymore. um, They have to be willing to do anything to try to secure a victory unless it's such a domination that no trick play will work. Right. So, I mean, it's a very scary spot to be in with not a lot of tape on Jaron Hall. They've had some injuries, not just not. I mean, we didn't see the Nakua brothers play barely at all week one. Right. Right. I don't know how Gunnar Romney's ankle is. So BYU does have a little bit of an injury bug. And really the question is to me, like, so when I analyze a game, to me, the, the game is won when the, the BYU Cougars defense is on the squad and Utah's offense is on the field. And the question is, what can the Cougars limit that Utah did well versus Weber State to a degree, to a better degree than what the Utah defense can limit what the Cougars did well versus Arizona. 
I think if you put those two kind of, you know, sliding scales up, I think the chances of the Utes stopping what the Cougars did well versus Arizona is significantly greater than BYU's offense versus or BYU's defenses versus Utah's offense come Saturday. Yeah, I know. I agree. There are a couple things to look at, though, uh, that are really going to th- these are pretty much the things that are going to intrigue me the most, I think. First of all, uh, going back to the Weber State game, I'm not as high on the defense as other people. I mean, everyone likes to mention how um, Utah dropped a couple touchdown passes, which is very true. They did. Weber State dropped a couple open looks, too, that could have been touchdowns. So that's another thing that people aren't really remembering is that Weber State had a couple opportunities that they let slip through their hands. And I'm not sure that's going to happen with BYU. So I wasn't as impressed with the Utah defense. That said, it's a Utah defense. I mean, Devin Lloyd, are you freaking kidding me? Like there's Utah. I mean, there's one thing you can count on always with Utah. It's going to that they're going to have a great defense. Uh, it may go little bend, not break philosophy, but they're going to have a, a solid D. So I'm not all that worried. The most intriguing things to me, how is that defense going to handle a mobile quarterback? Because in years past, that has been a problem. That has been a big problem. The mobile quarterback and the air raid offense are the two major Achilles heels for past Utah defenses. So we'll see what happens there. Um, but also, Charlie Brewer coming in is huge for the Utes. I wonder... If having a, a guy who is a senior, he's he's had he's had a lot of football played in his life, uh, he and he's coming in from out of state, is he not going to be as affected by the the hype surrounding the rivalry? Is he not going to be as emotionally invested already as a lot of these other players? So maybe he's a little bit cooler under pressure. I don't know. But that's what I'm curious to find out because. Uh, I, I think the offensive line needs to be better for him too, though. Because, and I know, understand there. No, I don't know if all of them were out, but the majority of them were not playing against Weber State. Uh, our starters are going to be back there. They're going to be better, but they have to be. Yeah, I mean, everything you said is true. It will be interesting to see how Charlie Brewer's lack of familiarity with the rivalry and being a transfer in, if it you know has the impact that it might have on say a Jaron Hall. Right. who's been in a, the BYU program, understands, hasn't tasted victory, been close. It'll be interesting to see, you know, if if we think or if fans think the pressure is getting to them. But you're right. They need to be better up, up front. I mean, wholeheartedly. I would like to point out, and, and one reason why I said Utah's defense is Clark Phillips. Like, you know, he was good in coverage at Weber State. That's not what impressed me. He was willing to hit people. He was like and hit them hard and try to tackle them. That's the number one corner showing how you lead on defense. Um, and that's going to be important because if BYU is going to try to run, then corners are going to have to tackle. Yep. I mean, here's the part like, yeah, I, I, I hear you, the mobile quarterback. But I mean, if you just look at the game versus Arizona, they were outgained total yards. Granted, you know, Algiers running uh, allowed them to have double exactly 80 yards more than Arizona. They had less first downs. They weren't as good on third down. They were one or one on fourth down. Three penalties, no interceptions um, by BYU. So they won the turnover margin, and that's probably why they won the game, right? So, I mean, while Jaron Hall didn't play poorly, a 24-16 win over what is a, apparently going to be the Pac-12 South, if not conference, uh, you know, seller dweller, if you will, doesn't give me a whole lot of confidence that against a better defense, an established coaching staff, and a team that's looking, I mean, because I think BYU is feeling the pressure, sure. honestly. sure They can say they're not, but I think the fan base – the coaches and the players do feel the pressure to get the victory. And for Utah, it feels like they're sort of playing with house money. Yeah. That's what it feels like. Definitely. Which is dangerous though. Yeah. Cause I, yeah, I agree a hundred percent. It's, it's, it's fun how the dynamic has changed throughout the years and evolved. And even like just the personalities of the head coaches and the way they view each other has changed. Like it feels, I could be wrong. 
I could be totally missing the mark on this one. But to me, it doesn't feel as angry and vitriolic as it has in the past. And I don't know if that's Kalani Sataki setting the tone because he's saying all the right things. Whereas Bronco, you just there was just a disdain there. He hated the U. Uh, I don't think he and Kyle Whittingham liked each other at all. But the camaraderie between these two head coaches now, I think, I don't know. I could be wrong, but it just feels like it's more jovial. You know, like it, it, it's still there. The animosity is still there, but it's not as angry is what it feels like, which is interesting when you look at the climate of this country right now, that a, a, a rivalry game could be more cordial than uh, just going out into the regular world. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's you're right. It, it feels like it's subsided a, lit, a little bit, the, the vitriol, if you will. But it's still there. It's still you there. Know? I mean, I can you can sense it underneath, like while they're trying to say the right things. They're only saying the right things. It's as if True. they don't mean them, really, True. frankly. You know what I mean? And they probably mean them a little more than maybe when they said them in the past. But how much more, I'm not sure. I just think they're more gentlemanly to each other. Well, and that's true. I, I was talking more of the fan interaction I've seen. Like, there are a couple on both sides, younger. They're all younger uh, Twitter warriors out there who are just the most obnoxious people in the world, I think, who are really taking it pretty far. But other than that, I, I kind of just see kind of harmless poking back and forth. And I, again, could be wrong. I could be totally off base on this. That's just my anecdotal evidence. Um, our boy, Nate, the hemorrhoid, of course, he didn't leave us a voicemail this week, but he did chime in. He, he sent us an email and I'm glad he did because dude, it's rivalry week. We got to hear, we got to hear from, from Nate, the hemorrhoid. If you're not familiar with Nate, the hemorrhoid, good friend of ours, a longtime friend of the show. Uh, he was, when he was a child, he was a BYU fan. And now, and as he, when he got older, he converted to be a Utah fan. Um, and now I will say he writes BYU in here in this email quite a bit. When he writes BYU, the B and the Y are, are lowercase, but the U is capitalized. <laughs> so that's that's how he feels about this rivalry. He says, been a while since hearing the words of uh, the of let's see. Let me start that over. Been a while since hearing the words of hemorrhoid through dog's beautiful voice. Thank you, Nate. But I'll keep it shorter than my normal takes or maybe not. Rivalry week, baby. I'm with Deuce. If we can play this game every year, then they should play it. And we talked about that. Totally agree. Absolutely. But let's talk previous games. The Weber State game wasn't great, but I'm not as disappointed as you all. The Utes didn't open up the playbook at all on offense. It was so boring of an offense because they knew they could win by just doing the basics. Not one deep ball to Dixon slash Covey and didn't even use Keithy. True. Very true. And I think we all kind of expected that. Anyway, Brewer looks comfortable and I love having him run the offense. The defense held the Wildcats to three points technically. Uh, special teams and backups let the other 14 points happen. Well, technically, they allowed 17 points. So I got, I got to disagree with them there. <laughs> like, it's they let, they let the points happen. So it doesn't matter where it comes from. Okay, BYU played as good as I expected. But if people really believe Arizona is a decent team, they're crazy. That team is so bad. Might be the worst team in the Pac-12. Their offense is very bad, and the defense is so slow. I'm not, I'm not taking the win away from BYU, but BYU beat a bad Arizona team, plain and simple. That being said, I'm feeling 31-20. Late field goal by Utah to put away a much closer game than expected. Oh, well, a win is a win. So I, I'm kind of with them, man. Like I, kinda, I think it's going to be a close game. It always is. Yeah, look, I mean, and what you saw, it will be interesting to see if, look, we know Kalani Sataki, because of the defensive tree he came from, likes to play man defense. Right. He played right. so much zone versus Arizona. And once Arizona quit trying to beat the zone over the top and just dink and dunk it, 12-yard route, 5-yard route, 8-yard route, 19-yard route, whatever, they moved the ball on them. So if you're being perfectly honest, right, Arizona, who most people consider to be a, a lower tier Pac-12 team, can do that and make it close once True. they figure out what to do. The expectation, at least from a Utah side, is that they will be able to do it from the start and better. I think the reason you see Kalani playing zone on defense is because he's extremely worried about getting beat deep. I mean, it's no mystery. Again, he comes from Kyle Whittingham defensive tree. The one thing Kyle Whittingham other than special teams errors, is giving up big plays. 
If they're going to drive 80 yards on us, we don't like it, but that's life. Right. What we don't do is give up a 50 yard bomb 30 seconds into the game. Right. So, I mean, the fact that he's employing that strategy, but from a zone perspective defensively leads me to believe that there isn't quite as much faith in the defensive backfield as we had been hearing throughout camp, or you'd be playing a man. True. You'd saw this a little bit last year. They were young. They were green. The Utes played more zone in the five or six games they played last year than the previous like eight years combined. Yep. Right. Uh, so I think you kind of know where BYU sits, at least from a defensive perspective. And you're probably going to test that early. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see, to Nate's point, a Jalen Dixon deep shot early. Could just be. to loosen him up. Could be. Right. Um, and really, I mean, really the bottom line is, is if Utah's offensive line plays up to its standard, I think last week it didn't really play up to its standard. I mean, you look at the stats, you know, and you see Tavion Thomas, 12 carries, 107 yards. Uh, Charlie Brewer, 19 of 27 for 233. The interception doesn't really matter. You think like, ah, they must have played pretty well. Not really compared to the opponent on the field. And yep. you hit on this a little earlier. The offensive line has to be more solid. They have to. And they have to, and they have to open up holes. And one thing that we haven't discussed that is also very important, and I'm sorry to take so much time here, Doc, that you that Kyle Whittingham talks about is the turnover battle. Yep. I, for all that Tavion Thomas did really well last week, and it was a lot, I'm not trying to downgrade his performance, he also put the ball on the ground twice. Can't do it. And not on huge hits, you know? Right. Not on crazy great defensive plays, kind of what you expect on every play for a running back to deal with in football. Right. That's a concern. It was I don't a- think if you go back over maybe one year, Utah won in the last nine and lost the turnover battle. It's so important. It's so important. I mean, look at the Dallas Cowboys last year. They needed Ezekiel Elliott more than anything because Dak Prescott was out, and he just kept fumbling and fumbling, and look what happened. And and you just – it's so important to win that turnover battle. You have to. And so if I agree 100%, if Tavion Thomas is going to be putting the ball on the, on the ground, uh, Utes are going to have a long day. They, they just they can't allow that. They just cannot. Agreed. So do you want to you, – you're not changing your score? No, 35-21 I, I think is legit. You know, I mean, look, and I'm not say I'm not saying it's not even going to be tight through the first half and maybe the start of the third, right? Like I think it'll be uncomfortable at points. But I think in the end – just as you saw Arizona have late game success versus BYU, I think the Utes will have late game success and more than Arizona had. And consequently, I think they get the 21 point dub and 10 in a row. Agreed. Um, okay. If you had to pick, man, let me ask you a question. If you had to pick and try to stay away from like, obviously Charlie Brewer needs to have a good game, right? right? Obviously Devin Lloyd needs to play pretty well. So not like the mainstays. Don't throw me a Britton Covey. Okay. No, don't throw me a Tavion Thomas. Like, Because often in rivalry games, it, there is always this one player who doesn't necessarily show up week in and week out. It may be on special teams. It may be a nickel corner who barely played versus Weber State or, or something like that. If you had to pick like a dark horse on the Utah or BYU team or both, to be the one who makes the play that really kind of shifts the momentum or determines if the momentum continues. Can you do it? It's hard for me to know. It's very hard. I'm just going to go out and just say Clark Phillips because he, I mean, talking a little trash this week, not bad, but a little bit, you know, it's fun. That's why we like rivalry week. And um, I just think he's got to back it up and I think he can. And so I, I just, with a guy like Jaron Hall who gets out of the pocket I, seeing it, it, Clark Phillips can can make a big play, I think that could be a huge difference. Just like one big play from him, uh, cause a fumble or, or, I don't know, tackle for loss or just something big in a key moment. I can see that coming from his position, and I can see that being a game changer for the Utes. I don't know. I could be wrong. I mean, here's the thing, dude. Everyone around 
the local media, all the fans, us, everybody who's talking about this and previewing this game, we don't know anything. Like, that's the thing. Everyone's just guessing. We can sit there and act like we know and we have all the stats and we know all the guys and we know the game plans and all that stuff. We don't know anything, especially this week, because it is rivalry week and these games are so crazy. So don't listen to anyone who knows who says they know what they're, what they're talking about because they don't. We're just all guessing. Yeah, that's true. For me, it's it's Brandon McKinney. OK, I, 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 if you know the safety, like as I imagine it, I think early on there's going to be I don't think the Utes are going to play it safe defensively. I think they're going to say you couldn't agreed. You could not make you could not be Arizona's DBs and defensive backfield, but you could run, and that's what kind of gave us some fears. We're bringing it. We don't think whether it's either Nakua brother or Gunnar Romney, we think sure you may get a completion here or there, and you know maybe even a big one, but the the negative impact and toll we will have by getting pressure on Jaron Hall outweighs that your chance for success for a long play against our dbs i mean i expect to see that defense just chomping at the bit the the thing that worries me though is just that he's so mobile jaron hall's so mobile so that's the thing that worries me even when we watched tyler huntley up here on the hill uh it took him a couple years before he learned when it was okay to throw while you're on the run you know, like it, it took him a while to settle in. So as a BYU fan, I might be a little nervous about that because it does things when thing, when the play breaks down and the quarterback is running and Jaron Hall is fast, dude. He is like super fast. It Extremely. gets a little chaotic and he might not know. Maybe I can throw it on the run. Maybe I shouldn't. I don't think he's he has he's had enough experience to really uh, make those decisions yet. I could be wrong, but. As a youth fan, if you're blitzing, 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 man, like I'm worried because that's where we get beat. That's where we've got beat year in and year out for mobile quarterbacks. Uh, that's true. I mean, I think they'll be able to get pressure, but here's the thing also that goes about that and why I picked McKinney to be my my sort of dark horse to make big plays. When you're not comfortable throwing on the run when the play breaks down, and you see this a lot like with Baker Mayfield in his first year with Cleveland or other players who had done it successfully at different levels, you miss that one DB who's spying you. You ha- he has the whole field in front of him, and you're now you're trying now it's sort of reversed. Whereas when the safety is having to run and not be able to have the whole field in front of him or a DB, it's harder to react. But you're running trying to throw, and he has the whole field in front of him and can sort of see what True. you're seeing. Good point. So I think they'll be if he does that, which I think would. He has to do it in certain things, and hopefully they're just not blindly wide open behind the defense. We've seen that before. Yeah, many times. Like the situation you're discussing. Right. But it can also put him in the unavailable position of letting it go and be like, oh. Right. And then it's a pick. Right. So, I mean, and he didn't really look to do that versus Arizona. He uh, he looked to run. And when he took off, he was quick. You're right. Like, extremely speedy. But whether it's Sewell or Phillips or Lloyd or McKinney. I don't know that he can. I mean, you know, a player can make great plays, but can he do that consistently where it really scares the socks off you? Good question. Very good. I don't know. We're pretty, the Utes are pretty fast defensively. True. Um, I'm just excited, man. This is going to be fun. (laughs) I, I just like, it's again, I'll be relieved when it's over. If the Utes win, I'll be crushed if BYU wins. But it's just it's just such a good week. And I don't understand people who don't like even if you don't think we should play BYU. How do you not love this week? That's what I don't get. I I don't understand that. Doesn't matter. You you know, when I got talked to back in jazz season about color of shoes and you guys told me I didn't like to have fun. I want to point out that half the people who hate the rivalry like colored shoes, like obnoxiously colored shoes on the basketball floor, but hate the rivalry. And I'm just wondering. Who doesn't want to have that? Fun? That's coincidence. Not not. Uh, mm. it, it, that's just a coincidence. It's not correlation. It's, it's not correlation. It's just coincidence. Mm. OK. Uh, OK. Utah State. Let's let's I, I'm sorry, man. We, we went really hard on that. We only have like 10 minutes left in the TV show. We'll probably be going long. So if uh, if our discussion gets uh, shortened and you're watching on TV, head over to dogandnews.com or Spotify. Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, anywhere you get your podcast and you can hear the remainder. And also YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash DD on sports. And you can hear the remainder of this conversation. But um, Utah State, dude, 
And I feel bad that we had to kind of push them off to later in the show. But the Aggies got the win of the week of all three schools. I mean, that's that's pretty cool, man. And I understand the Pac-12 North looks like a dumpster fire right now. It's a disaster. But what was the line? I can't remember what the line was. It was, it was here, I'll tell you. Oh, no, I didn't write it down. Um, it was big for Wazoo, though. So I don't know what happened to them, but good on the Aggies. I mean, Kyle Anderson, your first game, and then you come out and you get that victory against a Pac-12 team, um, that's very impressive. They should really hang, especially when you're picked to win three games all year long. If this is one of them, I mean, that's pretty sweet. I mean, I hate to be the one to say it because the Washington State Cougars have always held a kind of like a, although Ryan Leaf and Drew Bledsoe torched us, so they maybe did. not. But for some reason, they were like, you know, it's like Oregon State and Oregon. Like, I can't really not like Oregon State. Like, I want to beat them, but, like, I feel bad for them, you know? Right. Washington State kind of held that spot in my heart. But with their new head coach and all the tomfoolery that he discusses, like, this was my most happy victory of the week. Like, for sure. The, the, the Aggies rolling up to uh, Pullman and putting it on them. And not just that, by winning the fourth quarter, 15-3. to three, Comeback victory. The, I mean... Yes, excited. And I hope it's turning. I hope this isn't just a one time deal. I think we both had him going five and seven. Is that right? I think so. I'll check. Dude. And this was not one of those victories for no. me. No, absolutely. No, we didn't pick. Neither of us picked him to beat Wazoo. That's correct. Yeah, we so, had him going I mean, five and seven. That was our prediction. Yeah. On, on their way. I had right? a schedule. I mean, Let's hope they don't do an Aggie thing or a Ute thing or a Jazz thing or an RSL thing and, you know, poop the bed versus North Dakota this week because coming off a high like that on the road versus a Pac-12 school after everyone told you you're going to have three, three victories, um, it's exceptional. Bonner it, it played is. well. Peasley did all right. Washington State looked a little, especially in the second half and in, in the fourth quarter, I couldn't tell if it was Utah State's defense or they just looked or confused or not playing well. Regardless, so happy. Like, But here's the thing. You're a Pac-12 fan. How, I mean, you, not even a part of you is bummed that not this all. conference looks awful yet again. But it didn't. Remember, UCLA okay, did one, not look different. One impressive win. Well, let's see what Oregon does this week. We'll right? see. I mean, they almost lost to Fresno State. They did, but Fresno State's good. They're good, but are they... Don't forget that. Eh, that, I, I shouldn't have been that close. I mean, we'll see. Shouldn't have we'll been see. that close. We'll, we'll see. I mean, what a victory. I, I have a question for you. What do you think about Ed Ogeron's sissy blue shirt thing? Like, I, I, I thought that was... Uh, that was pretty... I don't, I don't like that word, man. I, I, to me, it's, it's offensive a little bit. You know, like, not to me, but I can see how... That can be an, in, let me say insensitive. I think that's it. And yeah, I don't well, like not it. Not just that. Like, I mean, it's iconic. First of all, you're wrong. It's freaking UCLA. It's John Wooden. It's the Rose Bowl. Like their color is epic. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, and I would point out that it's yellow and purple. <laughs> right. For freaking Louisiana right. State, which I think is epic, too. I mean, what a weird thing to do and then have your ass handed to Dude, you. Dude, you cannot platter. you cannot walk into the stadium talking trash and then when you're favored and you're LSU, you're LS freaking you and then get dropped to UCLA. Like, and no no disrespect to UCLA, but typically they don't live up to the hype. And they right. typically uh disappoint. And then you go in there and you get dropped by UCLA. That's embarrassing. I mean, dude, you call their jersey sissy and their running back averages 11 yards to carry against you. I mean, dude, dude. you know, like, <laughs> you know, Ed there Orgeron, isn't more kind of mono and mono in the trenches. I'm not going to let me beat you. SEC dumb talk about how they're so much better to call them sissies walking into the stadium and now 11 yards a pop and look like. The team wearing blue wasn't the sissies. I just enjoyed every minute of it. Like, do you, do you I, think I was maybe just, some of that came from uh, his leftover from U USC? He brought the, he brought some of that with him. Some of the the vitriol for UCLA. I think that came from uh, that. That's a good point. You know, I had never th I actually didn't that did not register 
And now that you say that, I mean, that may be true. Maybe I should give him, but still there, yeah. to say that and then just get your ass handed to you. It's not good, man. I'd be very quiet if I was a coach. He's just, I mean, Bill Belichick for all the hard times we give him, he very rarely has a misstep with the media because he doesn't because say he doesn't say a damn thing. <laughs> he doesn't say anything. At all. Dude. He, yeah, dude. Like it's you, you will always come from a stronger position. The more you keep your mouth shut. I feel like that's the case. And I feel like that's kind of what Kyle Whittingham has done. I mean, we saw him do it the one time against Wyoming where he talked trash. And I think he learned from that because he looked stupid after that. He looked stupid. So uh, it's I think it's what the strongest coaches do. It's what you need to do. That I think that's why Dabo Sweeney drives me crazy. Truly. Because he just can't shut up. Like, he's just got to be in front of the camera. It's all about him all the time. So, yeah, I mean, Ed Orgeron, I mean, he's a character. He's a weirdo, um, but you can't be talking trash that blatantly and then not perform. I mean, I think sort of like he fits the mold for what you want for a Louisiana state head coach. And now sure. I know the reason why he wasn't the USC head coach. He's, he's not an L.A. Right? guy, man. Like, he, he's not meant that for kind L.A. Of stuff only plays so long in Southern California. Yeah. You, unless you, you're winning national titles. You you he's not built for that environment, man, at all. You know, like he's not. It's not who he is. You're being very kind. Very I, I'm kind. trying to watch my words very carefully. So, but the Aggies, let's go back to the Aggies. They are taking North Dakota on this weekend. Here's the thing that surprised me. They beat Washington State. They're going in to take on North Dakota, an FCS team. What, I, I, what would you guess the line would be after a big Washington State win? It's at home for the Aggies. Any guesses? I don't want to put you on the spot, but. Well, they got a three-point victory versus a Pac-12 team, maybe a 10-point margin. It's six. And I don't know if that's just, I don't know what it opened up at. So it may have moved to get a little bit closer. But to me, you got to give the Aggies more respect than that, dude. And F- well, it, C- it may F- be team. more a condemnation of Washington State. And it could be. And I'm fully on board with that. An FCS team, an FCS team. Like, I don't like if they can if they beat Washington by three, they can beat North Dakota on the road. They can beat North Dakota by more than six. I mean, I am tempted to go out to Wendover. I'm tempted to jump on one of these websites. That is ridiculous to me. I just don't I don't see them losing or or only winning by six. I mean, I I put the victory probably more the, the 10 to 14 range. I mean, I'm hoping for that. Like, I hear where you're coming from, but I think it's more a condemnation of of Washington State. And also, I don't think they're exactly sure what they have. Right? I agree. That's that's probably right. I agree with that. I, I don't think we know who anyone is at this point. Week one suck. That's they the- do. I mean, we'd like to. We'd like to, I, and, and and even with the Utes and the Cougars and and the Aggies and my analysis of all of it. It's so vanilla, right? And right. it's so just not a true reading of what these teams will look like even this week and in the weeks to come that it's really hard to know if anything that we feel like we're sure of today will be sure of in six weeks. I, I'm pretty sure Devin Lloyd will be good if he's on the field. Agreed. That's what I'm sure of. It's the only thing I know. Right? That's it. And I know, well, I, 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 I don't know it, but I'm, pretty confident that Charlie Brewer is going to be confident in the pocket. I don't know it for sure, but he looked, and as a youth fan, we didn't mention this as a youth fan. It's weird to have a, a, a pocket passer. It's weird to see a guy go in there like, like Peyton Manning and just know when to roll out, know when to stay in the pocket and just look so comfortable in there. Strange. It's amazing. And I, I, I want to be clear for people who listen to our thing with Tucker. I was a little concerned with his arm strength, but I truly believe he makes up for that in in his mental capacity and understanding the playbook and what defenses are doing. But maybe even more importantly, in his leadership skills with the team. Agreed. Agreed. As your phone goes off. Yeah. Way to go, buddy. Way to, way to mute that. <laughs> yep. Uh, okay. Let's let's move on. I think that's it for the Aggies, right? I mean, wh- what's your score? For, yeah, we got to do a score. I, I, you know, place. I don't know much about North Dakota. I'll throw it out there. Aggies win 21-18. I'll go with the three-point margin. You own, Wow, dude. 
That like you only think the Aggies are going to put up 21. This is an FCS school. Do I need to re- reiterate that again? No, you can hammer that home. Dude, I'm going 35-21. I feel like this is a few years ago when you were Aggie heavy. Do you remember that? Yes. Their last well, year you had it. There was, yeah, I was, I, I, part of it was I was kind of wishful thinking because I wanted to see little brother do well. Uh, and part of it was, well, that was it, man. I was just, you know, uh, but. Trying I, to be a good guy. I, th- I mean, honestly, with this one, it's an FCS team. If they, and like, they do run the risk of this being a bit of a trap game. No doubt about it. I agree with that. But it, I got to think if they can put up 26 on Washington State, I, I understand Washington State is not good. They're better than North Dakota. They're be- and they were on the road. They're better than North Dakota. Now but they come they? home. Now the Aggies come home. I got to think they're going to put up more than 26. I, I just to me, it just and I understand. I Look, next week, I'll probably be proven a fool like I have been many times when I picked the Aggies. Many, many times, but I, I just think they're going to do it, man. I just, I don't see how they, I don't know, three points, only 21 points. I, I see them putting up more than that. Just my two cents. Okay, what else do we got on the docket? We got NFL. We also have Donovan Mitchell. He's been making some headlines as he has. Um, kind of a controversial thing. Let's go with NFL, though. Should we do that? Woo! So excited. So excited. Now, this we are definitely, without a doubt, uh, going to run out of time while we're in the middle of this segment. So I'm just going to say it now. If you're watching on TV, head over to YouTube.com slash DD on sports if you uh, are interested in watching the rest of this conversation. If you're fine just listening to the rest of this conversation, head over to anywhere you get podcasts and download episode 381 and uh, finish out the show because we still have a lot to talk about, man. We have only scratched the surface on this rivalry week game. Uh, okay, let's 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 talk some NFL, bro. It's, this is your time to shine, man. No, this is your shining moment. One shining moment. A crazy thing that we found out, uh, like Tom Brady got COVID after raging. <laughs> yeah, I'm not shocked. I'm not surprised at all. Do you think you would have ever found that out if he still played for the Patriots? Absolutely not. He I is totally like, agree dude, with he that. is That's like, funny that. So like, here's the thing: was he just tight lipped back then, or was he just kind of on a on a very short leash with Bill Belichick? I don't, I think it's even clear the great Tom Brady didn't want to mess with Bill Belichick because his willingness to speak freely certainly seems to be uh, picking up. He's like, ah. And as time with Bruce Arians continues down the road. I had surgery. I had COVID. Like, all this kind of stuff that would just never, ever be uttered. You know? I mean, it must be nice for him because Bruce Arians no shrinking violet. He'll say whatever he thinks. And so he's, you know, I guess he's taken on the mantra of his coach. And now we learn more about the life and mind of Tom Brady. It's kind of fun to see, uh, to see this different side. Like, you don't – usually when a player or a coach or whoever – has been in the league for so long. You know who they are. We know who LeBron James is. Uh, but Tom Brady, to, to see him take on this whole other personality is like, say what you will about him. I'm not a big Tom Brady fan at all, but it's kind of fun to see it. It makes him a little more endearing. Agreed. Like, it's hard Agreed. for me to say that as well and kind of swallow. But in a way, it's like going to be the best thing for his legacy possible. I, I agree 100%. Um and Bruce Arians really does just kind of let him do whatever he wants. Right. But here's but the he, thing. And he has to understand that Bruce Arians is going to say whatever he wants about Tom Brady. Right. But if you're Bruce. I mean, he set the tone, right? Tampa Bay, he's like, yeah, we won the Super Bowl, but we didn't win the South. True. That's, That's true. That's what Bruce Arians said. But he, And here's the, also, the other thing. They talk about how they have interacted, you know, between the coach and player relationship and how. Uh, Brady's much more involved than he was in New England in, in deciding what plays they're going to run and the personnel decisions and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's Bruce Arians just saying, dude, I have Tom freaking Brady, man. He's making my job a million times easier. Right. Why not embrace that? Why fight that? That's stupid. You have and the great, the greatest of all time. By the nature of his time with Bill Belichick, you're going to get passed on sort of the Belichick brand to a certain degree. Right, Tom Brady, Brady may be a little more fun with the press now, but I assure you, when when the horn sounds and it's practice time, 
I'm going to be willing to guess he's still uber focused and not the nicest person to be around. Agreed. There's no doubt. Of course, man. He's still, you know. So, so it's like the best of both worlds for him and Arian. Well, they are opening up tonight. Yes, the sir. football 2021 season Woo. against the Dallas Cowboys, who have been on hard knocks. I'm, uh, I guess the, the season finale of hard knocks has aired. I am still catching up fantastic they have a drone shot in i think episode three that blew me away and you know we talked about this last week the filmmaking that goes into this is insane this drone shot that they did goes on for like two minutes straight it's be i mean it's just as someone who's in film and has worked on on projects like it's just fun to see how this stuff comes together so that's a lot of fun um and also it makes me a little bit more invested in the storylines going on with dallas you know like i don't like the cowboys they might be my most hated team, but I like these guys who are playing for them, and I, I like the story, so it's I'm much more invested. Um, that said, I still got Tampa Bay beating them. Got to. I mean, they're getting rings while it's the perfect sort of uh, stage for Dak Prescott to reenter and establish who he was, uh, you know, until he was hurt. I don't know that they can do it. I mean, that de- I'm you know, and I'm honestly a little bit concerned for Dak Prescott. Coming up against this Tampa Bay defense, who is aggressive and gets to the quarterback, coming off an injury like that, that's not the the opening game that I'd want to see if I was Das Prescott. I hope he gets out without an injury. I mean, I think the 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 Bucks win the game and win it like twenty four to seventeen. Yeah, no, I I I, I can see that happening. Um Let's move on. Arizona, Tennessee. Whew. Let's let you do the Titans all the way. Despite Same. Rabel having COVID and who else? I mean, they got, who did they pick up? Julio Jones. They oh, did Brown. they? They didn't. What? I, I didn't hear that. Did they? Yeah. Wow, dude. Okay. Tennessee. All right. Coming for the throne this year. They. I mean, I they are, man. Back there. I mean, it's kind of crazy just to think that. It's just weird. These teams who just are, are, you know, this is why I love the NFL. Anyone can can win. Like literally the Super Bowl, it's it's not like the NBA where it's kind of a foregone conclusion, at least who's going to be in the finals. You, you never know. Every single year it could be anybody. And that's what makes it so fun. So much parody. I mean, I think it's safe to say the Texans aren't winning. It's probably safe to say that. But, I mean, to make but sure. here's the thing, man. You never know. Like, you ne- <laughs> like I, I'm not going to say they are. A couple years the ago. The optimism in your voice is encouraging. But, I need this at this point in life. But here's the thing. The Bills a couple years ago, they didn't win the Super Bowl, but they came out of nowhere and started playing well. This happens. I mean, there's always a story of a team who you don't expect to do anything who just pops up out of nowhere and plays well. So yeah, just- they are not going to play Deshaun Watson, and they don't have J.J. Watt. They I, just traded look, Roby. Like, I get uh, it. I get it. I just, I'm just saying, you never know. I appreciate the optimism. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. I'm, I'm here to bring the optimism, James. Someone has to. Jacksonville at, speaking of the Texans, at the Houston Texans. I'm going with Urban to get the victory right out the gate. I would point out he has never lost his first game with any program. Well, Ever. He's also Bowling green. That makes me sort of nervous. I initially I have Jacksonville down and I'm going to stick with it. But they didn't look too good in preseason. And I'm not sure. I don't know. But I'll stick with it. But I think this might be. I wouldn't. Even though I just said the Texans have no chance. NFL is a different beast. I'm sticking with my Jacksonville pick. We'll see if Herbs can get it done. Um, Let's move on and go Chargers at the Washington Football Club team, Washington Football team, who will be named soon, from what I hear. Yeah, that's the rumor on the street. I got the Chargers. I'm really excited to watch, and I get a lot of Chargers football here locally, just because of where we're situated. The CBS afternoon game is oftentimes Chargers. Yep, I'm excited to watch them. New head coach. I got Chargers. I got the Chargers as well. So far, we're exactly the same. You're gonna need to pick the same as me if you're gonna. Take That's this trophy true. away from me. I I'm going to run it out for the first five seasons. I'm first five weeks. I'm just going to pick exactly the same. And I should mention for those, uh, and this is this is addressed to a very small, small segment of our audience, but there are some people who are on our football pool with us that we play in. 
Uh, this is a bonus, man. You listen to this show and you you know our picks before they are all locked. This is a bonus for you people in the pool to listen to this show every week. Just just saying. Throwing it out there. Uh, Minnesota at the Bengals. I'm going with the Vikings on the road. I knew you would. And here's where here's where the difference starts. Okay. Joey Burrow. Let's go Bengals. I got the Bengals at home. Uh, all right, let me mark it. Oh, come on. And Okay, Minnesota for me and Cincinnati for you. All right, next one up is the Jets at Carolina. This is Zach Wilson making his triumphant debut for the New York, the power program that is the, the New York Jets. Just a stellar history there of, of football. Um, we haven't really dove in to Zach Wilson and – we talked a little bit about what he did in preseason. We haven't really discussed what we expect from him in the NFL. This might be a good opportunity to do it real quick. Uh, what do you, I mean, what do you expect? Maybe, maybe not this week, but in general, in his first season, what do you expect to see from him? I mean, first of all, let's applaud him. He was named team captain yesterday. It's a big deal for a number two pick. Um, and while in moments he's looked decent, not great, nothing that's going to, earth shattering, right? He's looked pretty good and times and other times he's kind of struggled and looked like the NFL defenses were getting the better of him. The bottom line is, is unless something drastically changes up front and on the defensive side of the ball for the New York jets, he can play really well and they can still get throttled. True. And I expect that to happen on Sunday. I'm, I'm picking Carolina like, and, and let's not forget he's going up against San Darnold. Who he replaced? True. Who, if Good point. he has a competitive bone in his body, is going to want to put it on the Jets and Zach Wilson, and I expect him to do it. So, but what, how do you expect him his rookie year to go for him? Maybe not the record, but how, do, you, do you expect him to perform well? Do you, do you see him uh, playing well? I mean, I think it'll be up and down, as most rookies are. I think there'll be one game where he, like you know, throws for three hundred yards, has a two or three touchdowns evades a whole bunch of pass rushes and they're close or win that game. And then I think there there'll be games where, you know, when he plays the Buffalo bills twice a year, he probably won't look very well because that defense is good. And the, his offensive line isn't. Yeah. I just, I, I don't up and down. I see him struggling, man. I just, I see him struggling. I, he was great in his senior year at BYU, obviously, they didn't play anybody, you know, they didn't play anybody. And when they did, he got burned. And to me, everything that made him great at BYU is, is not there in New York of all places. I, he's, he's never really played outside of Utah. I mean, he's road trips and stuff and road games, but he's never had to be outside of his little bubble, his little environment that he has where everyone's telling him how great he is. Uh, the media fawning all over him. If he struggles, that New York media is going to eat him alive. And I'm not sure he's mentally prepared. I don't know how much adversity he's dealt with in order to help him prepare for that moment. So, and I mean, to be fair, most people can't be ready for that. No, it, no exactly, for sure. But especially a kid from Draper who then went to Provo. <laughs> True. Like, there could not be a further place in the world to live your, to have your entire football career than New York. Like, that, that's those two places are not New York. Sorry. Although, the question does remain. I mean, I feel like given his status within the program and here locally, he had to have felt some kind of level of pressure. Granted, it's maybe not number two draft pick, but I think it was pretty significant. Uh, yeah. They're just in a location that's different with a media who's willing to say whatever they want. Look, and I don't want to read too much into to a, a little video clip and <laughs> anything could have been going through his head, but the discomfort that we saw in his face when he was next to, to the other draft picks on that video. Uh, and I mean, the only thing I can think of is that those guys were black and he hasn't met a whole lot of black people. That's the only thing I can think of. He looked visibly distressed. Like, and, and he's in New York, dude. Like, I, and I, I don't want, again, I don't want to read too much into it. I don't know what that was, but he was uncomfortable in that situation. He's, he's not, dude, that's going to get worse, man. Like, 
if you can't handle being around people who grew up differently from you, I don't know how you're going to be a, a leader in the biggest market in the world. I just, it, again, I could be wrong. I don't want to read too much into it, but I just, I'm not, I, it just seems like everything's set up to, to go south for him. I, I, I hope I'm wrong for BYU fans, and I know a lot of BYU fans are going to be screaming right now at their, at their uh, computers listening to this, but I just don't see it, man. I just don't see it. Well, he is, according to sportsbettingdime.com, the fifth ranked person to win offense of the rookie behind Trevor Lawrence, Mac Jones, Justin Fields, and Trey Lance. Now, look, I don't think, I'm not sure how much Fields and Trey Lance are going to see the field relative to the amount of time Zach Wilson, Trevor Lawrence, and Mac Jones are going to see it. So that may bode well for him, but up and down, you, you're expecting just like, terrible all year not terrible and i don't want to say terrible i just to me it's just it, it of all the places he could have gone i think this is the worst option for him especially with a franchise that's so mismanaged year in and year out they just really struggle i, I don't think they're going to be doing him any favors i don't think they're going to be capable of helping him in this situation i just i would have liked to see him go somewhere else that's it i think he I, he will definitely look man he's got that kind of patrick mahomes thing where he can throw it across his body and he could do those crazy things those are weapons that you it doesn't matter who the defense is if he has the skill set to do that he can do that so he will definitely have high moments i just thinking long run i don't think new york's the place for him man i just don't, again could be wrong i just don't see it happening though just my opinion um, where did we leave off? We left off at Carolina and New York. We're going to go to Philly at Atlanta. Atlanta, man, last year just collapse after collapse. But I'm still going to go with him this week. Me too. It's funny. And I feel weird because, like, Jalen Hurts performed well last year for, for the Eagles. Matt Ryan and Atlanta was in every single game and found a, win, a way to lose it. I swear to God, yep. it felt like that at least. Yep. I think they're going to turn the tide on that. I got the Hawks or the Hawks, the Falcons okay. as well. Pittsburgh and Buffalo in Buffalo. Who Is this game with? of the week? I mean, it's got to be close. It feels like it. It feels like it. And right now, Buffalo is minus six and a half. A little strange to me, but whatever. How could they not be, though? It's at home. And they, I mean, they gave everyone everything they could handle all of last year. If last year's any indication of the way the, the, the Buffalo Bills are headed, it's to the straight to the top of, of the AFC, them and the Chiefs, really. I For that reason, I picked Buffalo. Ben coming off an injury, shortened season, 11. Well, they were like 11-0 and 0 last year and then lost like six in a row or whatever it was. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I'm going Buffalo, too. It's just the line just seems a little, little big for me. I could be wrong, though. We'll see. Uh, we're going to go San Francisco at Detroit. I'm going to win the Niners. Uh, me too. Not much to say. Both of these teams have a lot to prove. I will be interested to see what Jared Goff can give us in Detroit. I'll be very interested. Seattle and Indy. Seattle. Yeah. All the way. Agreed. When in doubt, go with Russell Wilson. Who you got? I'm going Seattle. Dang it. And I assume you're going to be taking KC over Cleveland. To no Man. Part. It's at home. I, I, I am. That's who my pick currently is. This is where I get myself in trouble. Because now I'm going to be thinking about it. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Sometimes, for you're, some you're, reason. Your you're, you're, head is getting to you already. This is week one. You're in trouble, man. This is oh, as good as man, mine. I'm in trouble. I'm going to stick with it. I got Kansas City, but I wouldn't be surprised if the Browns get it this week. Well, that was a smart move to make sure you're sticking with Casey. Denver at the New York Football Giants. This is a hard one for me. Yeah, I agree. This is tough for me, too. I had Denver, but I'm switching to the Giants. Oh, you're going Giants. All right, I'm going Denver. Ooh, I don't know. Switch back, I don't know. Mm, what do you uh, – hey, man. You, you, it's it, just so hard to know. Like, the quarterbacks, like, I know they got um, Teddy Bridgewater in Denver, right? And he's a mainstay. Yeah, I switched back. I had Denver originally, just switched to New York. I'm going back to Denver. Going back to Denver, Teddy all right. Bridgewater over Daniel Jones. But the thing is, is Saquon Barkley going to play and be Saquon? I don't that know. That can present some interesting things for that Denver defense. And we should mention that these uh, picks are all fluid until the first game kicks off. So if James True. wants to change a pick, he has total freedom to do it until kickoff on Thursday. True. 
Um, where are we at now? We are at Green Bay and New Orleans. I know who you're going with. You're going with the Packers. Got to go with the Packers. The Taysom Hill era starts. Oh, wait, it didn't. Jameis Winston's the quarterback. Aaron Rodgers is going to be on a vendetta. Isn't that year. just so weird that, I mean, it was like Taysom Hill was basically the, the QB in waiting. And Sean McVay yeah. just really was just kind of shoving him down everyone's throats time and time again. He's like, trust me. Just trust me on this. I promise you. And then uh, Drew Brees is out. And like, nah, nah, I was wrong. We're not going to go that route. It's interesting. Yeah. There's a reason. There's a reason. There is a reason. Miami at New England. I got the Dolphins, although I am interested to see how Mac Jones does in his first start. Yeah, I, I think New England's favored. I, I don't quite see it. I mean, a rookie coming out, starting like that. I just, it's tough, man. That's a tough situation. It is at home, but I'm going with Dolphins, too. I think Tua's going to play well. Main reason, Brian Flores, man. That's a Belichick disciple. They don't lose week one, especially when they're uh, maybe on the verge of something special. True. Miami. Your Chicago Bears at the Los Angeles Rams. You think yeah. Andy Dalton's going to get it done? Sunday night. What a great way to end Dude, a, lot, a just... weekend, hopefully with a Utah victory and a Bears loss. It is. Just... I got the Rams all the way. I don't know why we're not starting Justin Fields. I know. You know, Nagy has his ties to Mahomes and being the OC there. Man, I just want to see Justin Fields on the field. Yeah, I I don't blame you. How long until he's playing? Three weeks, probably four weeks, five weeks, probably four to six, somewhere in four to six range. And then the finale of the week, Baltimore heading to Las Vegas to open the uh, I guess a game has been played in that stadium. So be the second game played in that stadium against the Las Vegas Raiders. Yeah, second game with fans, and I got the Ravens. I mean, Same. both of these teams sort of are struggling with COVID protocol, it appears. Uh, but I got the Ravens. I mean, the Ravens have been good since Harbaugh has been there. And while I want to support Chucky and the Las Vegas Raiders, I just can't quite yet. I got the Ravens. Well, we only have one difference this week. <laughs> so Man. We'll see what happens. I mean, we would add two, but you switched back to Denver. True. So, so it's Cincy and Minnesota is our one difference. Yep. That's it. So we'll see what happens. Uh, okay, let's let's keep going. Long show today, but that's okay. It's, this, is, this is a big week. We need to talk about everything that's going on. That's what we do here. Let's talk a little Donovan Mitchell. And this, is there something else I'm forgetting? Seems like that's probably it. probably I'm sure there is. Um, let's talk a little Donovan Mitchell and what's going on there. We've made no secret where we kind of stand on these issues. Unfortunately, these are political issues, which I think is stupid. I think it's more of a, a human being issue. Um, and Stuart Adams, the president of the Utah State Legislature. I, I don't know how to explain this without being snarky. And I don't want to be snarky because I don't want to turn people off because I do think this is a a very important issue that I think people need to be educated about. So bear with me. If if my snark comes across, I apologize. But he basically uh, said in a a video, and I don't know what this, where he was speaking. I don't know what this event was, but he said that they had a a law draft drafted up. Basically, they copied from, from Florida and Mississippi, if I'm not mistaken, That would, they just straight up copied those laws and it would ban teaching of critical race theory in Utah. And he says the reason why it didn't happen is because Donovan Mitchell was not happy. And so that stalled it, which, okay, like that's, that's one aspect to it. The other aspect, I, that this, and, and look, you can agree with critical race theory or not. To me, it's just, it's basically just teaching history. It's not taught in the schools. It's taught at universities. So the, why this is even an issue at all is just baffling to me, other than it's just the thing we're getting outraged about this week. But the thing that really rubbed me the wrong way was when he explained, when he said, we just we have to educate Donovan Mitchell about this issue. You are going to educate a, a, a very intelligent black man about critical race theory. You, a white person, 
is going to teach a black man about critical about how critical race theory is wrong. To me, that that is that just not only comes across as ignorant, it comes across as a little racist. That we have to speak down to this guy who just obviously could not. I mean, to me, I don't want to go off. I mean, I don't want to be snarky, but that was the part that rubbed me the wrong way more than anything. I don't know what your thought was. Uh, I mean, my it bugged me from, you know, start to finish. Like, look, I understand that state legislatures copy legislation. I get how it works. You don't want to rewrite the minutia of a bill. But you don't say that, and you don't say it when it's Florida and Mississippi. Like, look, Florida's beautiful. The Gulf Coast of Mississippi is beautiful. But they're not exactly, at least for me, how I aim to have my state ran. Oh. So when I hear a president of the legislature, literally the majority speaker, essentially, leader of our state government, saying he's copying from states that are woefully inadequate in their response to pretty much everything— <laughs> What are you talking that about? Florida, the, Florida's in, in great shape. Bugs Just the shit out of me to shape. start with. Yeah. Then he 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 backs it up with the kind of tone of like wink and a nod. These sports organizations and athletes kind of got angry with us and told us they didn't want it, which is, you know, a wink and nod to the shut up and dribble. Yep. And then you're right. Lastly, saying shut up and dribble and we'll tell you how to think to Donovan Mitchell, essentially. Exactly. It's offensive, it's ignorant, and it's goddamn stupidity at its finest. It, and if you're on board with this, recognize. If you're on board with this way of thinking, the world is going to pass you by. It already is. And you can I mean, hold on to it for as long as you want, and he can because he's a very powerful human, in our state at least. So he does have a degree of power with which he can make this a problem and an issue and hold on to it and an issue for his constituents and a political ad for his next campaign. He can do all that. But the simple fact of the matter is when things are changing and you can't really stop them from actually changing in the end, you're better to work with people and find solutions as, as opposed to tell people how you're going to educate them. Right. As if he is just the, the, End all be all authority on critical race theory. A, a guy who didn't even know what it was two months ago. Like, there's no doubt in my mind he he had no idea. Like this, what well, I and I, I again I don't know why out of the blue this became a hot button issue. Other than you know, as in politics in America, you have to come up with something to rage against every week or every month, and I think that's what it is. But to me, it's it's just bizarre. I mean, th this idea that critical race theory is going to just destroy America when it's not even taught in the schools, man. Like it's not even taught in the schools. It's only taught at high level university classes. That's it. And all it is, is basically teaching the history and the racist history uh, uh, of the country, which it's history. You, you should know like every single country in the world, every single nation has something that is, it is a giant black eye and embarrassment on their nation. This, this is not unique to America. It's not anti-American to say, this is where we went wrong, and this is how we can get better. To me, that's not even a political issue. That should be something that is instilled in children all over the place. When you make a mistake, that's okay. But this is how you move on from it. And you have to know what you did, and you have to learn from that mistake. To me, that's what this is. And just kind of covering it up isn't isn't going to be productive to anybody. And again, like this, this is a political issue. It shouldn't be, in my view. You're right, and and the politicians are making it a political issue for one reason. It serves their purpose, right? It doesn't serve the purpose of their constituents, right, or the betterment of our society. And you know, I just have to applaud Donovan Mitchell. He went on 1280 and responded yesterday, so he's not. I think the way Donovan Mitchell goes about his business with regards to issues of like this actually allows him to be a vessel for change. Agreed. Despite the negative, and I mean, I want to say bordering on racist because I don't like to call people racist unless I definitively know, but his comments did have a tinge of racist banter at the very least of like, hey, I'm president of the legislature. I know more than you. 
Even right. if it's not that, it's a, you know, like, look, man, I was elected. I know more than you. Even if it wasn't racism, it's definitely condescension. The, the okay? subtext was and, very uncomfortable. Let's just put it that way. For sure. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So, I mean, it's condescending, racist, however you want to do it, and unnecessary. Like, why, why not bring Donovan Mitchell in and have that be your photo opportunity and a discussion as opposed to just railing on him I mean, in front of a group of people who you know support what you're about to say? Well, and that's the thing. I, I, I really do think, look, we're, we're so divided as, as a country, uh, as a state, as a community, as communities all over the, all over the nation are, are divided to have even just the optics of them bringing in Donovan Mitchell to have the discussion, even if they just sit in a room and don't say a word to each other, just the optics, I think, would give a lot of confidence to both sides that we are able to at least have a discussion because nuance doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore. There's no discussion anymore. It's just, we're screaming at each other. And so even to be able to do that, this was a perfect opportunity for the Utah legislature, who, in my opinion, has failed us in so many ways in recent weeks, especially. This would have been a way for them to actually step up and lead. And they didn't do that. In fact, they opted to do the cowardly thing, the weak thing. And that's just speak in their echo chamber and not face any dissension whatsoever. Or provide a distraction yes. for all the past mistakes. Exactly, exactly. So to me, I, I mean, we, dude, we're just we're so lucky to have Donovan Mitchell. It's it's not just for what he does on the basketball floor, um, but what he's doing and what he represents and how he's trying to bring about change. I think is is commendable in so many ways. And I know people get really upset, and I mean, rightfully so. You know, if. If all these racists keep spouting their mouth, we're going to lose Donovan Mitchell. And that's that's right. I mean, that's a legitimate fear. But to me, I, I'm more worried about let's let's get his message out there. If he leaves because of the racist, then he leaves. There's more important things like I don't want him to leave. But to me, his message and what he's doing, I think, is far more important than what basketball team he's playing for. That's the truth. And that's the fact of the matter. I hope he sees all the responses about how absurd because I. Uh, the majority of the responses I saw were, come on, you know, we're siding with Donovan Mitchell. So I hope, I hope he's seeing that. And I know obviously there's people out there who agree with Stuart Adams on this issue, but the majority of what I saw was siding with Donovan. I hope he sees that because that definitively in and of itself is a change. It is. So I hope he sees that. And while it doesn't seem as significant as I think it is, it's there and it's working. And I, I know he'll continue to do the work. I hope people continue to listen. Well, it might be harder for him to see the progress because he wasn't born and raised here. But as you know, we were, and just to see the, the change in, in this short little time has been astonishing to me. Like seeing how many people actually do support him. I know there are a lot of loud mouths who don't, but to me, I don't think he would have even seen this kind of support seven, eight years ago. So to me, it's, I think we're moving in the right direction. We have good people doing good work um, and they know how to do it. And I just, it's, it should be commended. Like we, it's so easy to focus on the negative, but there's some good stuff that is happening. And we, we, it, life is so tough right now that we, I think we have to take our wins when we can, no matter how minor they are. Amen to that. All right. I think that's going to do it. We, we ended on a heavy note, but that's okay. We do that sometimes. Um, Rivalry week is here. Let's uh, let's just keep it cool. Like it, let's just keep have fun with it. Don't get too stressed out about it. I, look, I, I'm going to be bummed if the Utes lose, but it's not going to. I I will get past it because we'll have a game the following week. So uh, if your team loses, just get past it. It's going to suck, I know, but it's a fun week. Enjoy it for what it is. And the NFL is here. We're going to have James breaking down the NFL all season long, like he always does. Like I've said, I think in the market, you're the best person to break down the NFL. But for some reason, you just can't pick the games right because you second guess yourself. <laughs> Which is so strange. You know, it's just your backhanded way of complimenting well, that-, <laughs> that makes this thing go around. I mean, my question is, is like, if you had a trend our show, it'd be like negative heavy. Always have to end negative heavy. Like there's <laughs> it's very true. little positivity that comes out of these hour to hour and a half segments but i think we did all right it's rivalry so. week 
the Utes got a victory. You d- d- doled out a backhanded compliment. It, all is right in the world. Like it's par for the course. It's I can par for the course. All right, come back next week. We'll break down what happened in the rivalry game. We'll talk a lot more. And look, basketball season's like a month away. Is it a month away? Crazy. So we're going to have to start previewing that pretty soon, too. Our busy season just gets busier. So join us next week. In the meantime, let us know what you think of the show. Let us know what you thought of the game and anything else going on in the world of sports. Send us an email to doginduce at gmail.com. I'm Dog. And I'm Deuce. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks for making us a part of your rivalry week. 